So it's time for me to, to say a very warm uh, welcome, uh, first of all, to, to uh, our um, lecturers of today, uh, Dr. Haravin Kanesh and uh, Professor Matthias Kuhn, uh, but also to, to our uh, audience and um, to say that I'm very happy and proud to, to, to introduce and uh, this uh, very first uh, alumni Max Planck lecture series. So we have decided now that we have set up uh, an alumni program to, to, to uh, launch uh, a series of uh, events uh, involving our uh, alumni. And uh, in this case, uh, uh, Aravind, who has been uh, a research fellow uh, during the time he was preparing his PhD uh, here uh, in, uh, in Luxembourg. A few words about uh, both our uh, speakers of the day. So the now Dr. Aravind Ganesh is uh, for the next weeks uh, yet and uh, before moving to Maastricht, as I understood, uh, the Vice Chancellor's Research Fellow in Law at Oxford Brookes University, as well as a Reconstitution Fellow for 2020 and 2021. Uh, as uh, people uh, who were uh, in Luxembourg at the same time as him uh, know his research interests include EU law, public international law, private law theory, and the legal and political philosophy of Kant. This we know very well because many presentations by Aravind at the Institute were about Kant. And in June 2019, uh, just a few weeks after he left the Institute, uh, Aravin uh, obtained uh, his PhD cum laude uh, at the University of uh, Amsterdam. And uh, this is the, 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 this PhD, which forms the basis for the monograph, which was published in, in uh, March 2021 by Hart Bloomsbury as the 12th title under the Law and Practical Reason uh, series. And this is the book we are going to, to talk about uh, uh, today. Uh, before coming at the Institute, uh, Aravind uh, who was uh, keen to define himself as a distant stranger some, sometimes. So there was something related to his own experience uh, in the choice of his own topic. Um, Aravind uh, had worked before as a research associate for the UN uh, reporter for, on the right to food, Olivier de, de, de Scutter, and he also practiced as a corporate lawyer in New York. He also worked in South Africa uh, in the, the uh, country's uh, premier public interest law firm. So he has a very uh, diverse uh, experience all over the, the, the world and uh, also held fellowships in, in Belgium and in uh, Israel uh, at Tel Aviv uh, University. And he has published in, uh, in uh, many renowned uh, journals, including Legal Theory and the Michigan Journal of International Law. So it's the, 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 I have no doubt that this very diverse experience has fed uh, his, uh, his research. Uh, Professor Matthias Kuhn, I'm, I'm really uh, delighted to, to, to have with us uh, today. Um, you're a uh, professor of law at uh, NYU, but also Humboldt uh, University. Uh, you're, uh, I will try to say that I don't have the proper accent, that it doesn't matter. The Inge René Professor of Law at NYU School of Law, as well as a research professor on globalization of the rule of law until now I'm fine, it's now that it becomes more tricky for me, at the Wissenschaftszentrum Berlin for Social Fortune <laughs> and Humboldt University in Berlin. So you have taught and lectured uh, all, uh, all around the world. You have been a visiting professor and uh, John Harvey Gregory lecturer on world organization at Harvard's Law School. It's also at Harvard that you prepared your uh, GSD and uh, you have uh, studied law, philosophy, and political sciences in different uh, settings. Uh, it's another way of, of saying that uh, you also have integrated a lot of diversity and interdisciplinarity in, in your uh, path and uh, curriculum. And um, your research and, and teaching focuses on basic issues in global, European, and comparative uh, public law. Uh, to summarize your work, uh, it could be said that it emphasizes the analytical and normative connection between law, 
claims to legitimate authority and public reason and the institutional conditions under which such claims can be made uh, plausible. So when saying that, uh, I think I say something which immediately connects it to what uh, Aravind tried to, to explore in his work on uh, rightful relations with uh, distant strangers, Kant, the European Union, and the world, wider uh, world. So uh, Aravind will explain his book uh, uh, himself, so I will not uh, dig into the, the, the content, just underline that, that this is not the, the most usual count for international lawyers that uh, uh, Aravind uses in his research, the perpetual peace, but more uh, the, the Kant's philosophy of, uh, of right, the doctrine of, of right, that uh, I will uh, give immediately the floor to Aravind to introduce himself, what he intended to, to, to show his, in his book. So Aravind, you have the floor. Thank you so much, Helen. Like, I, I'm deeply grateful to, to you to, and to the MPI for having me back and, and to Sabrina for her, uh, for her wonderful organizational skills. I'm going to try and share this PowerPoint presentation right now. Do tell me if you can see what's going on. Is everything good? Okay, so um, this is the, the book. Uh, um, it, it is really a, a, a huge honor to be able to present this uh, before the... Uh, uh, to present my book before the MPI Luxembourg, which was uh, because my this book was pretty much workshopped within the walls of the Batiman Baika before, uh, as, as Helen mentioned earlier, several very bewildered uh, audiences at the referendum runda that I'm sure you're all very familiar with. I'm, I'm also doubly, no, actually triply grateful to Matthias. Firstly, for having taken time out of his incredibly busy schedule. Uh, and secondly, for having examined sort of, as well as approved the thesis, more importantly, on which this book is based. And thirdly, most importantly, because, Mat because I actually stole the title of this book from Matthias. Um, I, I organized a, a panel at the ICON, uh, uh, annual ICON in, in Berlin, and uh, Matthias very kindly offered to chair it. He suggested the name for this panel, which I've only tweaked very slightly, Rightful Relations with Distant Strangers. So I would, have, uh, I would have liked to have uh, cited uh, Matthias here, but I don't think it's appropriate to put a footnote on the very front page of the book. <laughs> so at its heart, my, the, the book aims to set out a theory of morally defensible global legal relations. It's not the same thing as global justice. Huh? Uh, morally defensible global le uh, legal relations between political communities on the one hand and distant strangers on the other hand. What do I mean by distant strangers? Non-members of those political communities located outside of the territory of the same, okay? Specifically, I aim to explain how and when political communities may claim rights of jurisdiction. That is to say, to speak law, to exercise authority over distant strangers, and how and when those same distant strangers may claim obligations of accountability from those political communities. As I look back now, um, the fact that it, the thesis involves, that the book involves the EU at all is very nearly coincidental. It is true that I set out uh, uh, intending to write a PhD thesis on the legal implications of certain uh, treaty articles uh, which appear to commit the EU to advance human rights, rule of law, democracy in its relations with the wider world. But as time went on, I found that you know, answering the questions I'd set myself was, you know, these inquiries were so necessarily conceptual and moral that, uh, that what the end result was a philosophical discussion that could be of general application to any political community regularly exercising jurisdiction over persons, regardless of how it is constituted internally. So the book is organized in the following fashion, right? I start by describing the nature of the EU's relation with distant strangers. From a, very, from a close examination of EU measures and jurisprudence uh, asserting extraterritorial jurisdiction, I demonstrate that very often the EU, in numerous policy areas, it pursues its goals by directly telling distant strangers what to do. In other words, it doesn't just create factual effects over them, 
it creates legal effect. In yet other words still, it exercises not power, not only power over distant strangers, but authority. So this doctrinal exposition leads to two normative questions and, and one semi-normative, semi-descriptive one. First, how can such expansive claims of authority be defensible? Second, do such claims of right over distant stranger, defensible or no, do they give rise to obligations towards them? Third, does the EU live up to these obligations? The answer to the, my answer to these questions are in, in, in series, uh, in sequence, yes, mostly, yes, and no, okay? So yes, such as mostly, these assertions of authority are mostly defensible. Yes, such claims of right give right to obligations of accountability towards distant strangers. And no, the EU does not live up to these obligations of accountability. So after setting out the, recent, the research questions in the methodology, uh, chapter two of the book starts by examining a number of articles in the constitutive documents of the European Union, namely the Treaty on European Union and the Treaty on the Functioning of the European Union. And, and these, uh, these articles, these provisions, they purport to commit the EU to advance several goals in all of its relations with the wider world, okay? These include human rights, rule of law, uh, democracy, as well as a number of uh, 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 goals that are often uh, uh, brought under the, uh, the broad rubric of global public goods. Now, the most obvious legal significance of these pr uh, provisions, uh, particularly Article 3, Subsection 5, TEU, I argue that if these uh, provisions have legal significance, it lies in providing grounds or competence for measures that assert extraterritorial jurisdiction in uh, policy areas such as competition, aviation, marine safety, environment, so on and so forth. Importantly, I, as I said, I claim that these extraterritorial measures, they don't simply in influence, incentivize, manipulate, or, or nudge distant strangers into doing what the EU wants them to do. Rather, these, these, pro, these measures, they directly tell distant strangers to do something, okay? How do I, what do I mean by this? Consider, I, I demonstrate this by, by considering two prima facie extraterritorial measures, both of which uh, advance an environmental agenda. First of which, uh, the uh, EU emissions trading directive, which required all airplanes landing in or taking off from aerodromes in EU member states to offset carbon emissions for the entirety of the trip. And second, the, uh, the sections of the US Endangered Species Act that were, you know, was subject to litigation before the WTO in shrimp turtle. Now, the secondary literature uh, often lumps these two measures together as if they, are, they were identical for all salient purposes. In contrast, I demonstrate that there is a subtle but very crucial difference between them. The measure in shrimp turtle essentially operated as a prohibition against the importation and sale into the United States of any shrimp caught on the high seas using nets that also tended to ensnare endangered turtles. Okay, at no point did that statute presume to tell foreign fishermen what nets they could use or could not use on the high seas. All it did was to say that if any shrimp was caught with such nets brought into the US, this would attract uh, uh, a sanction under US federal law for contravening the prohibition against the sale of such shrimp in US markets. It's as if the, uh, the, the legislator was saying to the distant stranger, uh, to the foreign fisherman, we can't tell you what nets you can or cannot use in the high seas. All right, if you, but we can tell you what you can or cannot sell in the US, right? So if you think you're tough enough to survive without access to US markets, by all means, go ahead and use those nets on the high seas. Knock yourself out. Now, imagine if instead the statute had directly imposed a, a, a sanction directly for catching shrimp on the high seas using those nets. 
imagine if the statute had instead been phrased as, if you use those nets on the high seas, do you, we will fine you the moment you enter port. Now, this would have been different, right? This, uh, in, in this second case, it would have been as if the statute was directly presuming to tell people what they could or could not do on the high seas. In other words, to exercise jurisdiction there. In chapter two, I show that the EU emissions trading directive, as well as a great deal of other EU extraterritorial regulation is like this. It's like this second case. Recall the uh, uh, emissions trading directive, right? which required all airplanes, uh, reg regardless of the nationality, to offset their carbon emissions for the entirety of the trip, uh, both entering and leaving an airport in the, in the EU. If, uh, if some uh, airplane, no, if some airline uh, uh, service provider had decided not to off offset the carbon uh, emissions, the, 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 the directive would not have, you know, like no member state would have, uh, would have refused landing permission to that plane. Okay, that, that's, uh, that's not what have happened. Rather, upon landing, it would have attracted a fine of 140 euro for each unsurrendered emissions allowance. So this is not, really, not just the EU emissions, uh, trading direct, emissions trading directive, many other uh, regulatory measures from competition to data protection, they work like this, okay? So this brings me to my first normative problem. How can such expansive claims of extraterritorial authority ever be defensible? What gives the EU the right to speak law for distant strangers who have neither had any say in, 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 a, in, a EU, in EU lawmaking through uh, you know, some democratic process? And um, moreover, the EU prescribes it for them before they've even set foot in the EU. What gives the EU the right to do this? One very popular answer essentially looks to the types of benefits or welfare advanced by such uh, um, extraterritorial measures. Using a conception of public goods borrowed from the economic sciences, a bevy of international lawyers broadly argue that where such policies uh, generally advance human happiness, uh, but, but which tend to be undersupplied by states or other political communities acting on their own, Individual, well-placed individual states or, uh, or political communities can, within certain limits, of course, unilaterally assert authority over non-members in order to provide them. Now, the most impressive recent expression of this was, uh, was by A.L. Benvenisti in uh, his Groschen-inspired writings uh, on the theme of sovereignty as trusteeship of humanity, okay? In, in a series of articles and, and a book, he contends that individual sovereign states are answerable not just to their own peoples, but to all of humanity, and that it is this second expansive office of fiduciary accountability towards all of humanity that in fact uh, justifies sovereign rulership over territory. Importantly, Ben Benishti understands uh, rule over territory as an office of proprietorship over discrete sections of the Earth's landmass. Okay, so it's as if the sovereign is like a, a trustee holding land as uh, as as uh, uh, as beneficial property for the interest of all of humanity. It's like, uh, the sovereign is like an English trustee. All right. Now, Cedric Reinhardt the foremost contemporary scholar of the international law of jurisdiction, he develops upon Ben Benishti's notion of fiduciary obligations towards all of humanity to derive a theory of unilateral extraterritorial jurisdiction to advance universal values, global values. So both Ben Benishti's and Reinhardt's, Reinhardt's strategy turns around formulating a series of maxims whether the rule to be applied extraterritorially has been expressed in some widely subscribed international treaty, whether, an, whether identical or similar rules are to be found on the statute books of other states. Uh, number, two, number three, whether the regulating state has you know, heard or consulted foreign stakeholders in the formulation of its extraterritorial regulation. And, uh, for, and, and last, uh, crucially, like the one that's most interesting for me, whether an 
whether the extraterritorial measure providing pursuing global public goods or universal values can be can be applied at no cost to the foreign subjects of the rule. Okay, the core assumption of uh, shared, I think, by Ben Benisti and Reinhardt is that for something to be wrongful or objectionable as against another, it must, it, it lies in producing some harm, producing some externality that affects them, all right? So as, if it doesn't cause harm or doesn't affect them, then it's not a problem. Now, there's a very well-known passage in the, 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 the Free Seas where Grotius argues that it would be a violation of natural right for you to refuse another you know, flame from your torch in order to light this. Someone comes up to you and says, I want to light my torch. You've got a burning torch. Can I take some flame from your torch? If you say no, Grotius says, you are, you are committing a violation of, the, of, of natural right. So why? why is this a violation of natural right? Because it doesn't cost you anything. It's no skin off your back to give them some flame from your torch. So a major plank of Ben Vinishti's theory of sovereign obligations to foreign stakeholders uh, cites this passage to argue that sovereign states may not withhold resources or facilities such as uh, vaccine formulas or, or disease samples, unused vaccines. Uh, they may, they, uh, states may not withhold these things to foreigners if letting them have it is costless. In his own work, Reinhardt sort of expands upon this claim to, to argue that it cannot be wrongful for one political community to assert jurisdiction for the benefit of the world generally, because the, assuming, of course, that there are sufficient consultation procedures, etc. In chapter three, I argue that this approach fails deeply. Uh, borrowing from, from uh, Matthias, actually, I argue that the advancement of global interests or values, assuming such things even exist, they cannot, they do not and cannot in and of itself justify the coercive assertion of authority over distant strangers. Because the, the idea of a wrong is more than just, is, is not reducible to that of a harm. Wrongs and harms are analytically different. A wrong is actually much, the concept of a wrong is much deeper than a harm, okay? Contrary to the Groshin torch example, uh, there's an example used in the book. Imagine if somebody climbs through your window in the middle of the night, not to break anything or to steal anything, but just to watch you as you sleep. This doesn't cost you anything, it's harmless, but it's still an actionable wrong in every single legal system we know. In fact, it would be wrongful even if they conferred some positive advantage upon you. Say, if they washed your dishes before leaving in the morning. Now, so for the very same reason, essentially, I argue that there is something deeply unsettling about the idea that one political community can make law for another simply or even primarily because it is good for them. None of the maxims uh, uh, specified by Ben Benishti or Reinhardt provide any rescue from this, I think, elemental truth. Even if a rule has been incorporated in a widely subscribed international treaty, that in no way authorizes, or authorizes one state to do the other state's job of enforcing, of enforcing that treaty norm. Conversely, you know, like, you know, stakeholder consultation, that, that's not enough to justify, uh, it's neither necessary nor sufficient to justify extraterritorial regulation. No amount of Japan opening up its legislative processes to Norwegian stakeholders, uh, nor even unilaterally giving Norwegians the right to vote in Japanese elections, could ever justify Japan making one jot or tittle of law to regulate, to regulate Norway's oil fields. So at the end of chapter three, I argue that these obvious intuitions can be explained not by reference to tendentious uh, 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 suppositions about how to maximize uh, undersupplied welfare, but by the very simple idea that no person is subject to the determining choices of another. 
I mean, think of what's wrong with uh, the example I gave earlier of this person who, uh, uh, this, this harmless nocturnal intruder, even though he doesn't cause you any harm, or he might in fact confer benefits upon you if he does your laundry or washes your dishes before leaving. Why is this an actionable wrong? It's, uh, you can't say it's because uh, uh, the intuitive answer that I, that I urge uh, is that uh, the reason why it's wrong is because you, your house, your body is yours. Only you get to decide what is to be done with them. If other people could step in and dispose of you uh, for, uh, uh, you know, for their purposes, this would mean that you, know, you would lack uh, uh, the capacity to make uh, purposes of your own. And uh, it would be as if you were, they would be treating you as a thing at their mercy. And this, uh, and this, and this reason uh, persists, even if their purposes are ultimately beneficial for you. That's why paternalism is, uh, is objectionable. So this notion of our basic legal status as lying in independence, that is to say, uh, of be in, in being sui juris, it's the sole organizing principle of the legal philosophy of Immanuel Kant. In a, in a passage known as uh, the uh, uh, innate, innate right of humanity, Kant says there is only one natural right. There's only one innate right. Uh, a, a right with which you are uh, that you are born with, freedom or independence from being constrained by another's choice. Insofar as this independence can co is is compatible with a like independence on everybody else under a universal law, this is your only natural right. Okay. From this, so chapter four goes on to explore the theory of goes to, goes on to set out the general the, set out salient portions let me see if i can get this oh dear um, chapter four goes on to specify the theory of law that arises from this organizing principle or at least those uh, those particular aspects of it that are necessary for my argument and this is where the, the book uh, do, departs radically from, from uh, most other works on EU law, uh, because I spend most of my time not on uh, the technical minutiae of EU treaty provisions and secondary legislation, or, or I don't even spend much time on, on public law. Instead, I spend a great deal, deal of time on private law theory, specifically uh, the three basic forms of the Roman private law, as well as with the, uh, with the concept of property. Now, why do I do this? Because the property and the forms of private law are the basic categories of rightful relations from which all other relations of right and obligation, be it in public law, international law, or cosmopolitan law, are, uh, these are the, all other forms of rightful relations are developed by analogy to private right. So, and these are, so Kant explicates uh, this very elegantly in a passage in his discussion of private law in the in the doctrine of right. Now, I said earlier that your your single natural right is to independence, right? And independence means being treated as a person, not as a thing. What is a thing? A thing is something that can be an entity that can be dominated and instrumentalized completely. You can possess it and use it at the same time. If being treated properly as a person means not being treated as a thing, this doesn't mean that you can't be used or possessed. It just means you can't be used and possessed at the same time. From this, from this basic idea, you get three possible ways in which people can interact, persons can interact coercively with one another. These are taught, contract, and fiduciary relations. The first of these, taught. This obtains when you know, other people have things that they are using and possessing. If you interfere with this, you commit a tort against them. Second, this is contract, all right? This is where people use one another without possessing each other. When, uh, when your employer tells you to do something, say file a report or, or write a, an encyclopedia entry, your employer is using you. See, but that is completely compatible with dignity. It's fine because your employer does not also possess you. You had to agree to do the job and you can always quit, all right? So this is the structure of contract. Use, but no possession. Now, the third, 
is where one person possesses another. When your mother tells you to eat your vegetables, you've got to do it. When your lawyer signs off a settlement agreement in your name, you are, you know, it's a telling phrase. You, we say that you are bound by it. It's as if you've been chained up. If another person possesses you in this way, they cannot also use you. Whatever decision they make in respect of you has to be consistent with your purposes, never theirs. This is the structure of fiduciary relations. Now, I need to add a further gloss on the category of torts. There are just two ways in which you can commit a tort against another, right? First of all, you may deprive them of their thing, or you may use their thing for your purposes, not theirs. The first sort of wrong, if we recall our early lessons in the law of obligations, has traditionally always been scripted as a violation of property right. In contrast, the second is scripted as a violation of a personality right. That is to say, a violation of one's right in one's body, reputation, or status. It's also axiomatic that questions of harm are relevant only to property law, or property, uh, uh, violations, pro property deprivations. And the appropriate remedy is to compensate you with the thing that you've been deprived with, right? And you need to prove that you've lost something and, and the extent of the loss before a judge. In contrast, for the, rem for the, second, kind of, uh, for the second kind of tort of wrongful use, this does not and cannot depend upon harm because either nothing has been lost or the thing, its value is beyond all price. Because compensation is not, uh, nothing can be compensated. The appropriate remedy is actually restitution. The surrender of the tort fees as gains arising from her wrongful use of these things. Now, these private relations of right and obligation are unrealizable without a particular configuration of uh, political, in political institutions invested with the right to use force, ideally the state, okay? Um, states are themselves persons and are constituted to have no other proper purposes than, purpose than assuring subjects of their freedom, which essentially makes them public fiduciaries of their subjects. The state gets to tell you what to do. This is compatible with your, your dignity only if uh, they act for your purposes, not theirs. So just as private law contains a set of legal principles preventing relations between fiduciaries and beneficiaries from degenerating into self-dealing, public law contains a set of principles to prevent relations between authorities and subjects from collapsing into domination. These are human rights. From this conception of independence as the sole organizing principle of law, I formulate a very different defense of extraterritorial jurisdiction to provide global public goods. Um, in chapter five, I define public goods not as things that produce utility or advance welfare, but as things that have to be provided publicly and, uh, and held publicly in any political community in order to ensure that, the, that its members are not systematically dominated and instrumentalized by anyone else. Public goods have to be held publicly in order to constitute the freedom of the people. And my prime example of a public good is taken from uh, Arthur Ripstein's uh, magisterial work. Uh, his example is public roads, okay? So um, now political authorities, paradigmatically states have an obligation to provide public goods. This obligation gives rise to rights against community members, not just to require them to contribute to the provision and maintenance of public goods, but also to prevent them from interfering with those public goods or with the state's ability to provide them. In chapter five, I show both theoretically and from doctrinal materials that these rights operate not just domestically against the members of the political community, but internationally. That is to say, against even distant strangers who by committing global public nuisances interfere or threaten the state's ability to constitute the freedom of the people. Nothing a state does that is necessary to provide a system of equal freedom for its subjects is ever wrongful as against anybody else because that's your natural right. Importantly, I show that such rights of jurisdiction do not depend upon demonstrations of harm, loss, or so-called transboundary damage. As such, I essentially argue that the environmental law doctrine 
known as the no harm or the harm prevention principle is actually incorrectly named. Because what's wrong with global public nuisances is not that they harm people in the manner of property damage. Rather, it's because they represent the same sort of usurpation that underlies one person wrongfully entering another person's house. In other words, what's wrong with pollution, cartelization, or any other form of global public nuisance, and which gives rise to the need for public regulation? It's not that it causes property damage or harm. It's because it's a private enclosure of something that rightfully belongs to the public. So this brings us to uh, uh, my basic uh, further uh, like departures from the Ben Benishti Reinhardt approach. The first is exp explanatory, the second is theoretical. The doctrinal issue is that uh, ben and, uh, the Ben Benishti Reinhardt approach is premised upon calculations of who affects who and what. Foreign stakeholders should take part in legislative processes because domestic uh, policies have extraterritorial effects upon them, for instance. Now, it just so happens that in, in defending the extraterritorial application of EU regulations, be it in competition and merger control, the, the CJEU has never, not once, relied upon something like the effects doctrine in American jurisprudence, okay? Um, rather, it's the only thing that matters is implementation, all right? The second theoretical disagreement is with their assumption that sovereignty is essentially the same thing as dominion or ownership, proprietorship over territory. My view, which I think Kant shares, is that territory is nothing at all like property. Remember, property can be bought and sold. My watch can be mine, yours, his or hers. Other things are not like that. Your body, your reputation, and your status. For this reason, I argue that territory must be thought of as the body of the state. That is to say, territory just is the state. In other words, uh, international wrongs have the nature of injury, not, not, not property damage, okay? Um, so as such, my answer to the first question is that yes, it is justifiable for the EU to make law for distant strangers. The uh, but there's some hesitancy because uh, the, the CJEU steadfastly refuses to allow uh, to subject uh, uh, to allow the EU to be subjected to the uh, uh, jurisdiction of international tribunals where questions regarding the proper purpose or the necessity of such uh, extraterritorial measures can be can be evaluated. All right. Now, so this goes on to the second normative problem, and the third one. Uh, I'll, be, I'll be over very soon. If the EU asserts authority over distant strangers, does it not owe them obligations of accountability in return? In chapter six, I argue that it does. Okay? Drawing from the jurisprudence of the European Court of Human Rights, I show that states' extraterritorial human rights obligations are, are under the ECHR arise not from an ability to wield influence or power over any particular distant stranger, but uh, identified solely with, with when the state asserts authority over them. That is to say, it's not enough just to, it's not the same thing as affecting a distant stranger. Rather, what counts is that the state must purport, or at least it must be, a case has to be made that the state has attempted to assert, to govern them, to assert authority. This is what I say, this is what I think the leading case al means when it says that what counts for, for whether there's Article 1 state jurisdiction is whether there is some semblance or pretense to public powers, okay? That is the lodestone for whether or not uh, uh, human rights jurisdiction obtains. So following, finally, this is the last thing. So this means that whatever the state, so the first question is yes, the EU asserts authority over distant strangers. And then I argue that, yes, authority, asserting authority means you have obligations of accountability in human rights towards distant strangers. Does the EU live up to these obligations? In, uh, in, uh, in my final chapter, I say no. Um, this might be a rather you know, expected or banal uh, statement, but I think what makes it interesting is that the same provision that is used 
to justify uh, these uh, awesome claims of authority over distant strangers. Article 3, subsection 5 TEU, the, the Court of Justice uses that same provision as the means for evading its obligations of accountability towards them. All right? For this, I turn to the uh, recent Polisario and Western Sahara campaign litigations. Now, both of these cases involved treaty arrangements between the EU and Morocco relating to the exploitation of resources in the Western Sahara. In other words, it's as if the EU and Morocco agreed between themselves to exploit the resources of a third international person. Um, I take it for granted that uh, the Western Sahara is, illegal, is occupied by Morocco, right? In chapter seven, I show that as a matter of the logic of interpersonal legal relations, a contract to dispose of things belong to the, belonging to a third person can be understood only as either of the contractors arrogating them to themselves the right to speak for the third person. That is to say, it can be, if it's not uh, uh, you know, like, uh, condemned as outright illegal, it can be modeled on a sort of negotiorum gestio as a constructive trust. That is to say, as both of the contractors holding themselves out as fiduciaries of the third party and consequently of that third party's own subjects. So I argue that you know, such a treaty arrangement as in both Western Sahara and Polisario cases, they create legal effects upon not just the, upon individual uh, Sahrawi persons, all right? My first complaint then is that the, the ECJ interprets uh, rules of procedure concerning judicial review of EU measures in a manner that shields the EU almost entirely from its obligations of accountability. Secondly, and more worryingly, it employs Article 3, Subsection 5, and the rhetoric about fidelity to international law as a sort of irrebuttable presumption of rectitude. Um, it's a kind of charming Betsy doctrine on steroids. Uh, this is, uh, it utilizes this to foreclose any and all imputation of wrong. Basically, the, the argument is, if something is internationally wrongful, the EU can't have done it because look at Article 3, Subsection 5. You know, the EU is committed to uh, uh, you know, advancement of international law, uh, human rights, and democracy in all, all of its relations with the wider world. In, uh, to put it differently, it's like you know, uh, uh, corporate crime, corporate criminal cases. Uh, you know, in, in all of these cases, uh, what, what the, the, the defense usually does is uh, to rebut the, the imputation of mens rea is to say that uh, we can't, the, the, this, the company can't have formed an, uh, uh, a mens rea behind this crime because look at our mission statement. Our mission statement says, do no evil. So that means we don't have mens rea, right? Article three, subsection five is deployed in a similar fashion in Western Sahara campaign. So final remark and I'll, and I'll end now again. The upshot of these cases is that distant, stranger, distant strangers are ultimately treated not as dignity bearing subjects, but as objects that may neither claim rights nor be owed obligations. My concern is not that the EU pursues its values in its foreign policy imprudently or hypocritically, uh, because ultimately neither imprudence nor hypocrisy are illegal. Rather, what I put into question is the extent to which the EU really possesses a constitutional order capable of rendering to everyone that which is theirs. That is to say, whether there is even an it to possess values at all. Thank you. Thank you very much for coming. Thank you very much, Arvin, for this uh, uh, presentation. I think for uh, many of our attendees, it has uh, rung bells also uh, uh, with the department meetings. And uh, when we, we heard about this topic and we can see how your, your thought has, uh, has evolved before, uh, giving the floor to Matthias, I would just like to recall all our attendees that we have a chat and a Q&A. And uh, so they can, uh, of course, make comment and ask questions and they can uh, raise their hands uh, as well. Um, this is just a logistical uh, comment and I'm happy to give the floor to, to Matthias. Thank you very much. Um, let me preface what I'm going to say by uh, saying that uh, I find this uh, dissertation uh, a remarkable one. Um, uh, um, it's quite excellent um, in, uh, that it's um, it, it's an example of uh, interdisciplinary work, but that's kind of become commonplace. Everybody's doing some kind of interdisciplinary uh, work nowadays, but it's rarely the case. 
um, that um, you have work which um, on the one hand um, is meets the highest standards of scholarship within each of the relevant disciplines. That's kind of the first criteria for successful interdisciplinary work. So here the philosophical on the one hand and the uh, legal doctrinal analysis uh, on the other. And on the other hand, that the two uh, are brought in a, a deep, fruitful relationship to one another, so that there really is uh, uh, a gain of insight that's produced uh, by this type of uh, scholarship, which of course, in this case, um, has also uh, happened. So, um, uh, um, this, so this is, this is uh, and, and the work that went into it is quite uh, considerable. Um, so um, um, when I was asked to um, read it and uh, comment on it in a variety of contexts now, I'm always very happy uh, uh, to do that. Now, he, uh, my comments, however, um, uh, will, the first one is methodological and will be critical. And the second one, if that's okay, uh, Arvind, I propose that we have a little bit of a conversation. Just I think the purpose of that will be primarily to clarify uh, some of the core claims uh, that you are making uh, that may be helpful for the audience, but also certainly for myself uh, to get a, get a real grip on some of the uh, core claims and their practical significance. So first, the uh, methodological point. And there is something um, you could have written, an alternative book, which, uh, which could have had the title, A Constitutional Theory of Rightful Relations, um, uh, uh, Rightful Relations, um, uh, with distant strangers. Um, and then you, the normative core of that would be Kantian political philosophy, uh, per Kantian legal philosophy. Uh, and then you would take, uh, you know, cases from all kinds of jurisdictions uh, relating to, uh, you know, whether it's competition law, extraterritorial re regulation or extraterritorial application of human rights, et cetera. With other words, the kind of issues that you look at very closely legally, analytically in the EU context are, of course, issues that come up in much the same way um, and are equally relevant, uh, say, uh, in the United States or Canada uh, or other states. So there is nothing distinctive in some ways about the EU, except, of course, that it presents itself in a particular universalist um, uh, way. Um, so um, and there are two ways in which you deviate from this. First, you, you focus on the positive law of one particular jurisdiction, the European Union. And on the other hand, instead of saying you're providing a general theory, you say, no, no, I, I'm doing Kant. Um, uh, um, and so uh, the question is, you know, what's the significance that this is Kant? I mean, um, I, is your, so are you, so one way we might understand this, actually, we that's not a plausible way, but uh, it could be mistaken uh, to be understood as, you know, you're using EU law um, on the one hand as a foil to clarify Kantian theory, which may be great for Kant scholars, so they get a deeper understanding what Kant really meant and Kant really was about. Um, um, but of course, that's not what you're doing. You're not. You're not a. You're not a Kant philologist. You're not a historian of. You're not interested in the intellectual history. You're interested as in Kant, I take it, and that's how you treat him and that's how you make your argument because you take him to basically, with regard to the basic premises and the core categories that are central to his uh, legal philosophy, he's right. Uh, so, you know, this is, this is these, these are the concepts and ideas that we ought to use uh, to critically reflect uh, on uh, what law and justice requires. So, so that's, I think, is an important point. And if that's true, then, um, I mean, you can still use Kant uh, because it, it happens to be the case that you believe that Kant got this basically right. Uh, you can still use uh, Kant uh, in, in the title, but you might not. And you just say, and, and you might uh, kind of develop your argument more freely. Uh, however, drawing and citing on Kant as you deem as, as is appropriate um, under the circumstances. Um, so that's one kind of issue, and yours is a yours is a normative a theory of rightful relations um, with strangers um, that draws on the basics, the basic conceptual framework of Kantian um, uh, um, uh, 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 legal political philosophy. So, 
Um, I think that's an important clarifying, you know, that's what, what this is. And now the second uh, method, the question is, how does that relate? So Kantian political philosophy um, or the right kind of legal philosophy, which in, in your view happens to be Kantian, how does it relate to um, EU positive law? Now, the way you present it is you say, look, here's EU positive law, and we see all kinds of things happening there, and there are many things that are contested and not clear, um, and here's an external critique of that practice. Here's a normative framework, and I'm going to use this normative framework to point to things uh, that uh, one ought to th think critically about uh, in an existing uh, practice, an external critique. In that sense, uh, your critique is, is um, kind of methodologically not all that different as if, for example, somebody would write uh, a Marxist critique uh, of uh, EU law. You just take, okay, let's take Marx's uh, premises and then uh, see uh, what we can say about EU law from that perspective. Um, but here's the challenge. Why wouldn't it be more, um, why wouldn't it be in some sense more obviously engaging for legal scholars of EU law um, to present the core arguments that you are presenting as a critique of EU law that is internal to EU law. So as an interpretative critique, many of the issues that you describe are issues that are contested within EU law. They're not clear. There's, there are all kinds of views about what the law actually is or how best to understand it. And why wouldn't your argument in many of these cases, at least perhaps not in all of them, but in most of them, be um, the right reading of EU law in light of the fundamental pr principles we should think of EU law endorsing is the following. And then you present basically the, the, the core distinctions and the core uh, analysis uh, that you present as a Kantian one. So why, why keep that separate? Now, in the introduction to the book, you've actually given an answer uh, to that question. But it's an answer that I don't find convincing. And your answer to the question why you didn't present this as an interpretative account of EU law is, again, a Kantian argument about um, the relationship between law, positive law, on the one hand, and morality uh, on the other. And you say uh, that unlike, for example, Dworkin, whose methodology would be very much in line with what I'm suggesting you should have done, you might have done, um, unlike Dworkin, uh, who believed that there is a continuity from mor uh, morality uh, to law, uh, in Kantian uh, philosophy, there isn't. Morality is cut off uh, in some fundamental way uh, from law. And in one way, that is absolutely true. When you speak of morality and you mean ethics, virtue ethics, what, how individuals should behave to be virtuous, to realize the good in their lives. Um, according to Kant, um, indeed, uh, those types of questions are on a radically different plane. They are just, there's a deep discontinuity between those questions and questions of law and rightful relations between persons. Um, but, of course, uh, Kant presents his legal philosophy in a book called The Metaphysics of Morals. So in his, um, in his understanding, the world of morality in an inclusive sense can be divided up into virtue ethics on the one hand, that's the categorical imperative and all of that. Um, and on the other hand, um, principles, now this is a, a modern way of putting it, a Dworkinian way of putting it, principles of political morality that uh, guide um, that determine the rightful structures of legal relations between persons. Um, so with other words, um, if, if, we, if, if we take up Kant's own vocabulary in this regard, uh, his account of the law uh, is of course a, 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 an argument of political morality um, uh, that you can, um, that on the one hand you can think of as ex giving, Kant giving an exposition of it uh, which can be looked at separately as a political philosophy, uh, what, what we would normally call or conventionally would refer to as a, a political philosophy relating to what just relations among persons amount to. Um, and then, but the question is, why don't we use, you know, given that the foundation of Kantian political philosophy is this innate right to uh, freedom, the fundamental freedom that we enjoy equally 
all of us. Why not? Is it really all that implausible to say that this is not at least one interpretation we could give to uh, the law of the European Republic, if you want to call it that, uh, underlying it, and thereby creating a tighter relationship uh, between Kantian political philosophy and actual positive law, um, which you can still put in this productive tension, and you can still criticize existing uh, certain part legal doctrines in exactly the way that you do. Um, but you would could frame it from an internal perspective and say, not only that somehow law doesn't live, this law is somehow to be criticized from some external normative perspective, which happens to be Kantian. Um, but you would actually say, this is an area of EU law that isn't yet developed in a way that it doesn't conform yet to the core principles that EU law claims to endorse. So there's a tension within existing law. The law is deficient on its own terms, not from some external moral perspective. It's deficient on its own terms. That's as a, from a legal scholarship perspective. That's, a, that's in some sense a more powerful argument. Um, I think it's for, for things to change. And to say, you know, I look at it externally uh, and I choose Kant as a framework and then it doesn't happen. You know, here's, here's some problems. Um, uh, that kind of, uh, it's, it's easier to push that aside and say, well, that may, whatever it is, but, you know, you law is you law, um, uh, and let's, let's take it seriously on its own terms. If you frame it as an internal issue of a EU law, which I think for, to a large extent, you could have, it's, it, it's, an, it's an, so this is not like Marxism, uh, that really could, you can only articulate a Marxist, a Marxist critique of existing law has to be an external critique, because whatever the EU law instantiates, it's not a Marxist political philosophy. Now that's straightforward. Um, but with regard to Kant, that's a very different issue. Uh, and there you can plausibly claim, I think, that at least with regard to the basic structure of the principles uh, underlying it, we can give it that type of interpretation. And indeed, there have been scholars who have given EU law exactly that interpretation, just that they haven't applied it to the foreign relations uh, part as subtly and as comprehensively as you have done. So that's the, so that's the kind of that's a methodological, not really critique. I mean, you can still do what you did and there's nothing wrong with that. But the question is, uh, why wouldn't it have been more attractive uh, to have uh, articulated the critique as an internal critique of the law um, uh, along the lines uh, that I uh, just proposed? So that's the, and we can just, that's the first core point. Um, the second point, I think, is, is one that I, we can elaborate more in conversation. So, um, and I want to go back, I think it's helpful to go back to the core, one of the core cases um, that um, you use to illustrate your argument. I mean, first of all, I have to, uh, I have to tell you that I, comp I comp first of all, I, I, in the relevant sense, uh, I share your Kantian sensibilities fully. Um, and I do think the types of distinctions you make between power and effects on the one hand and authority and governing somebody um, and the way that harms and wrongs are different in the sense that there sometimes are harms that are not wrongs. And secondly, there can be wrongs that are not harms, um, uh, that don't involve any harm. Uh, so all of that, I think, is, is, is hugely important and for many counterintuitive, um, for particularly an Anglo-American kind of slightly utilitarian tinged uh, understanding. Uh, these are to begin with counterintuitive, um, uh, but deeply important. Uh, and I think for understanding European Union law, uh, uh, deeply important suggestion. The reasons why the ECJ rejects the effects doctrine. Uh, the, the reason why competition law uh, doesn't just focus on the consequences on, for, for consumers. Uh, you know, all these features of EU law can be made sense of. Uh, quite easily within a Kantian uh, framework and be uh, actually defended as a superior uh, doctrinal structure when compared to the US, for example, US um, uh, um, doctrinal uh, equivalents. Uh, I, for example, find them simply more persuasive uh, than the US doctrinal equivalents. And there's no justification relating to culture in different contexts, et cetera, which explains why, which it might explain, but it doesn't justify uh, why one is different in one jurisdiction than uh, from uh, the other. So, um, so all of that I, I agree with, but now with regard to the handling of the specifics. So 
So here, let's take your core example that you also use today. The, the distinction between shrimp turtle, uh, where um, I think it was the US uh, said, if you use nets uh, for catching shrimp uh, that also enmesh turtles, then you may not import shrimps uh, into our uh, country. And you say, that's, that has an effect on, on the, on the, it has an effect on the fisher, fishermen uh, and on the fishing practices, um, but it doesn't govern them. It's not an exercise of authority over them because it just present, it just changes the situation the fishermen uh, are in. They can either comply or not comply depending on whether they care about selling on the American market, which they don't have an a priori right to. Um, uh, it's, it's up to you know, the American people to decide um, uh, whether or not they want to accept um, these kind of types of goods uh, on their uh, market. I think that is completely right. Now, the question is, how much different, how different uh, is, is the case with the uh, emissions uh, trading scheme that the EU has? So, and again, focusing on the, on this, on the situation of airplanes using fuel and having to offset uh, the carbon emissions uh, under the directive. Um, so that's the that's the so your claim is this is different. This is now governing. You this is this is not just changing the situation the airlines are in. Uh, this is actually uh, exercising authority over them, governing them. And you say that that is so because the, because you say the core difference is that the behavior of of these airlines is they're not being told look you can either land here or you but you don't have to. It's more like saying, look, you know, you have to actually comply with this. And the moment you land here, we will enforce it. And you'll have to offset, you'll have to pay the money, uh, et cetera. I'm not so sure. Uh, I, mean, I do agree there's a, there's a fundamental distinction to be made generally. I'm not sure it works quite like that in this case. Because I don't understand why it's, it's, it's not plausible to tell the airlines, look, you can fly around the world as, as you deem fit as long as you don't land on EU territory. Uh, and when you land in EU, lot, uh, in EU territory, we're not going to fine you for all the flights you as an airline uh, have engaged in globally. We only fine you for the flight, um, uh, which, you know, the whole flight, even though it's not over EU territory, admittedly, but we only fine you, um, or you only have to offset your carbon dioxide emissions uh, for uh, for those flights which actually land or take off um, uh, in the EU. And so you have a choice. I mean, it's not a real choice, but maybe for the fishermen, it's not a real choice either because the market is so important. Um, uh, uh, so it's not, it may not be a real choice for an airline to give up on the European market uh, and not land there. Uh, but it's a similar, it, it seems to me uh, to be, it's not obvious that it's a similar structure. And I think the distinction, uh, it would be different if the EU said, we will... You know, we, whatever the airlines do, uh, whenever they don't uh, conform to the standards that we define, uh, and whenever at any point in time we've, we have the planes here, they land here, we will find them for everything that they've done globally. That would be genuine extraterritorial application governing uh, those airlines. But what we see the EU doing is something, you know, not quite that. Uh, it's just saying, look, it's only when you land here, it's only for those flights uh, that we charge you, that you have to offset, uh, you pay your fees. And to that extent, it's more like shrimp turtle. So it's somewhere in between. Uh, and the difficulties are when you have these distinctions between governing and authority on the one hand, uh, and merely being affected and, um, and exercising power on the other. These are conceptual distinctions. They operate in an on-off mode. It's either one or the other. That's how it's like being pregnancy. You can't just be a little pregnant. Um, uh, so it's either one or the other. Um, and it's really, and so the, the, the question is how you really do the fine work of distinguishing the two. And this is, I think, an interesting test case, how you do it, um, because it's, it's, uh, it sometimes raises issues that I find difficult. Um, and I don't think, um, at least I'm not fully persuaded. Uh, by the way that your argument has done it in this case. That doesn't mean I have a simple and straightforward alternative solution. I don't. Um, uh, but it's this, it's, it re remains a puzzle as to how best uh, to operationalize uh, this distinction in such contexts. So that's, um, so, so that's, that's the first point uh, with regard to the substantive part.
And the second is, of course, in this case, you say what the EU is doing is okay. It's governing, it's exercising authority with regard to the emissions trading scheme over these other airlines, but it's okay. Uh, in this case, it's part of. It's not a wrongful relation. It's a right. It's part. It's. It can be seen as part of a rightful relationship. With, so it's a justified way of uh, regulating uh, extraterritorially. And now the question is, what exactly makes it rightful uh, under these circumstances? Why is this a rightful exercise of extraterritorial uh, jurisdiction? And now. Uh, now, please uh, correct me if if I am if I misunderstood this. Are you saying that it is it's it is rightful because the implementation of such a of this of this standard was necessary to conform with otherwise existing international legal standards such as the Kyoto Protocol that to be derived from the Kyoto Protocol, and the EU was just in this in this sense um, providing the implementation. Uh, of already binding uh, international standards. Is that, the, is that an, an important part of the reason? You put, could you put on your microphone? Your microphone is on. Sorry. Uh, that, that's, that does not go to the heart of it. That's, that's not the, it's not because it's, it's uh, the subject of international consensus. That's not the reason why. Now, the consensus wouldn't matter, but if it's a subject of international uh, legal obligations, that might matter. The no, that's not it. Uh, the The reason why, the reason why this is different, is because airplane emissions are a threat to the public good. Right. Good. Um, the public good, as you understand it, and not as as uh, utilitarians, market failure oriented types um, uh, 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 understand it. Okay. But then the question is uh, is the following. So even if this is a public good in the relevant sense. The question still is how, how exactly it ought to be provided. Mm -hmm. uh, so it has to be provided in some way. And unfortunately, let's say there's an international legal failure. So international law doesn't do its job. Um, so the, 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 the deep structural deficiencies with regard to this particular area, let's say, because there's a consensus requirement with regard to the Civil Aviation Authority. I don't know what was going on there exactly, but they negotiated for 15 years. They didn't come up. The negotiations broke down. They did not come up with a solution. And so the default was one where sovereigns can do as they like. And that means there's no provision of public good. That means that there's a situation of potential domination by powerful actors against others. So that's the deficient uh, situation that the EU now finds. But now we can understand that this is a deficient situation. But now the EU comes in and says, okay, well, we think it can be best dealt with in the following way, and we will kind of regulate uh, what uh, we th a global public good in a certain way. Now, of course, there may be others who say the might say the standards should be significantly more stringent, or they might say they should be significantly less stringent. There's going to be disagreement about what the right way to provide this kind of public good is. Indeed, that is the reason, arguably, why there was no agreement within the international uh, framework in the, among the International Civil Aviation Authority. So they just disagreed. Um, and even though the default not having any rules is a problem, it opens the door to domination, um, how is it different if you now have unilateral, um, uh, uh, even if you accept that there should be regulation? that this is a public good. Um, uh, but why is it okay for one actor uh, to now come forward and unilaterally propose, or not propose, it's not proposing, it's actually regulating um, uh, uh, how, to, how that public good uh, is to be provided? Why is that? I mean, is it just that there is no alternative? Is it just a kind of a, kind of a non-ideal type of situation? How should we understand this? It's still clearly a deficient problematic situation. Because the, the proper situation would be for this to be addressed into, to international law, Interna to international law to have the appropriate standard, have some kind of um, regime in place, right? I have actually become, I'm, I'm starting to like develop second thoughts about that actually over time, whether international law might be the appropriate venue for this. But uh, um, so would you like to... But how can it be? So, Mike, here's the problem from a Kantian perspective. 
Uh, why isn't it, uh, even if we understand this is a public good, um, this, it has to, you know, there, it ought to be provided by public authority. Um, but in the absence of a global public authority, so international law uh, to provide it fails. Um, uh, um, it just empowers sovereigns, and that's not a solution. It's a deep structurally deficient solution. Um, why isn't it an act of domination by a powerful actor, in this case, the EU, to then define unilaterally how that public good is to be provided? Okay. Um, shall I shall I address your your remarks uh, in sequence or like? Uh, let me see. Right. As you deem fit. <laughs> okay. I'll I'll go with the first one. Why why didn't I do an internal critique, uh, uh, saying that uh, uh, why didn't I start in a sort of like, look at, you know. EU measures try to try to develop uh, try try to identify what was the most uh, att attractive model case that could be made out of uh, out of these out of EU positive legal materials and then and then argue internally make some kind of imminent critique about the uh, uh, about how other aspects of EU law uh, betray the uh, the model principle contained in um, in the in the in the in the first pieces that I in the in the first pieces of, of EU legislation that I or materials that I was interpreting, I I that may indeed have have made a a, a very you know like uh, aesthetically pleasing uh, uh, story. I I don't know, but uh, I just don't think it would have been authentically Kantian. I don't think uh, uh, because uh, it's. No, Kant is not doing a a, a Dworkin on uh, on like uh, the uh, um, on on legal materials. No, he's not trying to like uh, um, uh, you know take the make a moral case out of what he's what he saw around him were you know legal claims of right and obligation. Rather, like this is a um, and and you were completely right to to, to, to remark upon my use of uh, terminology here. In uh, one of the pitfalls of trying to write a, a book for uh, uh, that straddles two disciplines like this is that it's, I've I've had to be I've had to take liberties with the kind of language that I that I use. You know, for instance, uh, I I I I. I I use the term fiduciary relations rather than Kant's own term, which is like a, a Dinglish persönliches Recht, a, a right to a person akin to a right to a thing that would not have tripped off the page or, or my mouth lightly. And similarly, I, the reason why I, I say that the, the reason I could perhaps have said, you know, like law and ethics are, and there's an adamantine barrier between them, but uh, but the literature, the jurisprudential literature, you know, like uh, the books are all. Now, the titles of books are the relationship between law and morality. So this was something that I decided to, you know, to retain in the book. So yes, it is right that uh, law occupies the first half of the metaphysics of morals. So the doctrine of right definitely has some necessary connection with morality, right? But uh, but uh, what what I mean by the word morality in in that first chapter might probably have been more accurately used your your mute Matthias. still mute you're still muted so sorry about that for Kant the doctrine of right his exposition of the doctrine of right is part of an exposition of political morality if we speak in modern terms so it is political morality so obviously Kant was not writing about positive law he was providing uh, an account of what uh, the right what you know what law should be. Um, yeah. What what I was trying to like uh, uh, you know express in that first chapter is that there's a there's a difference between ultimate moral ends like uh, that yeah, law has nothing to do with ethical ends like say generosity, love, companionship, that sort of uh, the, the, the ultimate goods. Mm -hmm. You know, like uh, um, there's this general. You find this in a lot of EU uh, external relations. Uh, uh, you know. Uh, literature itself, this idea that there are these values, EU values, and somehow uh, law is supposed to be a means of, of allocating yes, exactly. rights and duties between persons with respect to, in order to, to achieve those, those values, right, those ultimate values. I don't think that's how it works. 
Okay. Um, uh, uh, law is not just, it's not as if you get these values, you squeeze them really hard and you get a, a legal right and obligation out of it. That's like, uh, there's a, there's like, a, what, how, how law works is that it, okay. Ultimate ethical uh, ends are uh, uh, determined by the, you know, the, the, the principle known as the moral principle known as the, the categorical imperative, right? Yeah. Act in such a way such that your will can be universalized. But Aaron, that is that is uncontested. It's kind of a mainstream liberal political theory will tell you, um, as Rawls would say, the priority of the right over the good. So re relating anything relating to the good and virtue, etc., is off limits for coercive regulation uh, in liberal societies. That's what Kant says. That's what liberal theorists say. But that doesn't mean that there are principles, or you could also call them values, of political morality um, uh, that Kant himself has his own theory about. He just doesn't call it values. He calls it an innate, uh, fundamental innate right of freedom as the foundation. Others speak about the status of, of individuals endowed with human dignity and freedom and equality. But those are very, very close, arguably only subtle semantic differences. Um, uh, and are fundamentally principles of political morality, which in EU law have been codified as positive law. And that brings me to another thing. The reason why I prefer not to go down that route is because I don't think innate, right? The, the, the thing that I mentioned about it, independence, you know, not being a thing. I don't think it works in the manner of a value or as a principle or like, you know, like, like, like a Dworkinian principle as something that has weight. Rather, the way Kant sets it out, it's, a, it's as if it's, a, it's an organizing principle. It's, it's like a mathematical, uh, it really is like a, a, a ma an expansion of a mathematical equation. It's much more mathematical in, its, uh, <laughs> in the way it's elaborated than, uh, than, <laughs> than, than I could have, uh, than I could have you know, expressed if I had, uh, if I had if I had done this sort of internal critique. All right. So I, I agree that, that it might've been attractive, but I don't think it would have been authentically Kantian. Like, uh, um, or at least the way I, I read. Uh, um, um, okay, for instance, nobody goes to court uh, to tell the judge to maximize my, my innate right, maximize my independence, my sui jurisness. Rather, nobody goes to court saying that I am suing this person on the basis of my of my you know, innate right. Rather, your, your cause of action in tort or contract or, or unjust enrichment is built around the idea that you are sui juris. So that's the, that's the, that's the sort of uh, thing that I'm trying to capture. And, and that, there's another reason why I, uh, I, I, uh, I don't, uh, I, I, I didn't do the internal, internal critique of EU materials. Actually, because I, I actually don't think, despite the uh, the, the great deal of uh, very good literature about about uh, the EU as a you know instantiation of, of of Kant's ideas in the perpetual peace, I actually don't think that that the EU has has very much at all to do with what uh, Kant thought uh, would be the ideal political structure. In fact, I, I argue in the book later that it in fact has much more in common with his with Kant's uh, ultimate dystopia, which is a soulless despotism, which after it has uh, uh, destroyed the seed of the good will finally collapse into anarchy. Yes. That's... So, so I think I think Kant is much more old-fashioned and, and statist in in his idea of uh, so so this is why I also couldn't do an internal critique because I don't think the EU is a is a particularly a, a good example of a, of of people trying to, to implement Kant's ideas. All right. Um, as for okay the yeah your your second uh, uh, main subject. Uh, thing you, you asked me about was like, uh, you, you wanted me to explain uh, um, how the emissions trading directive is not, is, is, is different. It's not just affecting, but governing this and strangers, right? Um, okay, I'll go back to shrimp turtle. This is a discussion that, that uh, Helen has, uh, has heard me attempt many times. Of course, she's never been convinced, but, uh, <laughs> but like, yeah. so as we say, like shrimp turtle, uh, U.S. Uh, legislator says to the uh, the foreign uh, uh, fishermen, um, "Do whatever you want in the high seas. Just don't. But uh, we can't tell you what to do in the high seas. What nets you can use. But if you bring that here, we can tell you what can be sold and cannot be sold in U.S. markets. So we'll sanction you 
if you try and bring that stuff here, if you do that stuff here, right? Um, so the way this uh, measure works is that it's trying to get foreign fishermen to do certain things on the high seas, right? It's, uh, it's incentivizing or influencing uh, fishermen on the high seas to stop using those damn nets, all right? That's what the US really wants over here. So the way shrimp turtle, the, the, the Endangered Species Act, uh, the statute works is that it, uh, it influences, incentivizes, it nudges foreign uh, uh, fishermen into doing certain things outside the jurisdiction by threatening exclusion from that jurisdiction, all right? Now, what I think the emissions trading directive does is that it treats conduct outside the jurisdiction as if it has already taken place within the jurisdiction and on that, within the internal market and on that basis applies regulation, uh, applies uh, the jurisdiction's regulation to it directly. Um, I, I argued earlier that, uh, you know, if a plane landed in, if, if a plane refused to, uh, uh, you know, uh, if an airline company refused to offset its carbon emissions, the sanction would not be, uh, uh, the immediate sanction under the directive would not, would not have been exclude that plane from landing. You wouldn't say like, you can't land here. Rather, it would have been to fine the, uh, um, the, the, the state for not, ha the, the airplane for not offsetting off 140 euro for, not, for each unsurrendered uh, uh, emission uh, allowance. Aaron, right? Aaron, if I may interrupt, yeah. that can't be a fundamental difference. What if the shrimp turtle, instead of saying you can't uh, export to the American market if you use the wrong kind of nets, if they just said, oh yeah, sure, you can continue to import, uh, 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 to import uh, shrimps in the uh, market, but you just have to pay high tariffs. You just have to pay if you if you fish with these types of you know, turtle and meshing nests. Nest, mm -hmm. You have to pay a fifty percent tariff, additional tariff, um, on your shrimps. Then would, that would be exactly like the uh, emissions trading scheme, wouldn't it? That was actually directly litigated in Air Transport Association case. All right, in Air Transport Association, the uh, the the plaintiffs, or the, well, the applicants, they argued that uh, the emissions trading directive was was. Uh, it was a fuel tax that, uh, uh, you know, a burdensome fuel tax in violation of the Open Skies Agreement, okay? And uh, the, uh, the Court of Justice completely correctly said, no, it's, it's, it doesn't work like, uh, like that sort of exclusionary, uh, uh, it doesn't have that sort of exclusionary structure of, of uh, that scheme that you just described, Matthias. Rather, I'd say that, no, like this is a, a general emissions trading regime which you know, if you if you exchange, if if you know how to deal with your, if you know how to trade these emissions properly, you might even make a profit out of it. So this is a this is a, so that argument that that was actually specifically litigated and I think correctly uh, rejected in, in Air Transport Association that this is not uh, that the emissions trading directive was not some sort of uh, you know exclusionary. Um, its rationale was not exclusion. Its rationale was that we are going to include these foreign airplanes into this regime that applies for everyone, regardless of nationality, regardless of uh, geography. Um, and that uh, uh, brings me to the, well, is that, does that work? Like uh, that brings me to the final, uh, the last question, like, so what is special about, uh, about this sort of, uh, why, why does the EU get to do this? All right, um, and my, uh, so, it would be weird right now if I, I'm in Singapore and if and if Singapore prescribed a, uh, enacted a statute saying that all Germans wearing uh, sitting in Berlin wearing a black shirt uh, will be fined fifty dollars and uh, uh, and fifty Singapore dollars and this will be enforced only only when that person arrives in Singapore right this would be this would be you know, a wildly excessive uh, excessive prescriptive juris, uh, jurisdiction right. Um, the, the reason why the air transport, it would sorry, be widely excessive prescriptive regulation, it would be in what it would be in wild excess of prescriptive jurisdiction. Yeah, but not when some countries bind women to wear veils. 
uh, extraterritorial. Yeah, well, um, I do do such. Uh, I don't. You have countries where uh, women can enter without a veil on their head. True. Yeah. Uh, but no, just uh, just to. I mean, uh, the widely prescriptive that you were qualifying. I was uh, yeah. just mentioning that you have concrete examples. True. I mean, if such a if such a state uh, if if such a if a state enacted a a you know uh, a rule uh, you know criminalizing you know women elsewhere in outside the jurisdiction for not wearing a veil, well, that we would call that an excess of jurisdiction, right? So you might you might ask why is uh, um, why is it okay for the EU to to, to uh, uh, impose emissions offsetting duties uh, uh, obligations upon upon Chinese airplanes flying over the Atlantic Ocean before they have entered EU airspace. What's the difference between these two? And for this, I would have to say that whether uh, whether Matthias wears a black shirt or whether you know someone wears a veil, that is irrelevant to the public good. All right, but pollution or like the regulation of, you know, of, of air, that, that is some of, of, uh, of like the cleanliness of air, that is, that concerns, that is constitutive to the freedom of the people. And for this, let me, I'll, I'll elaborate on, uh, on, the, uh, on the model that I used, which was uh, Arthur Ripstein's idea of, of roads, okay? Now, imagine that you live in a, uh, in a country, in a community where every single square inch of land is privately owned, okay? Uh, everybody is, they, they, they think that the landowners, but every single square inch of land is under, is, is private property of somebody. In such a community, the only way you could leave your, uh, your house, say to talk to a friend, or come back home after you have left, is if you obtain the permission of every single intervening landowner. In such a system, even though it's almost as if your neighbor is, is your lord and you are their serf, because your neighbor gets to decide who you can talk to and who you cannot talk to, who you get to associate with. So even though you might think that you're free, you might think you are the owner of the land. No, actually the land owns you. Excellent, in, in excellent, Arend. I understand, I understand your conception of public yeah. goods and I understand how that applies to the emissions trading scheme, but here's the challenge for exactly that situation. Imagine now you have exactly that type of different properties, no roads. That's the yes. situation. There are no roads. And now, because there is no public, there is a public authority, let's say it doesn't do anything. It just doesn't do anything. Or it doesn't have the competencies, or you know, there's a political logjam, whatever it may be. They, there's no decision to build roads. And now imagine there's one property owner, uh, a mm -hmm. powerful one, that says, okay, well, I am going to start building a road now. Um, that's the equivalent situation. Is that okay? A private property owner, one of the many yeah. people, one of the many who have a property in that type of context, absent public authority that doesn't do, a, does, that doesn't do the job, uh, just starts doing things, starts building roads unilaterally. Is that okay? Yeah. That would not be okay in the domestic rightful condition, but it would be okay in the international rightful condition. Because in the international, in the international rightful condition, there are no, uh, uh, there are no ex states do not have any external objects of choice. There is no property in the international rightful condition, just body. There are only personal personality rights. So that is the, uh, uh, so, okay. Let me, so this is the, let me go back to the, uh, the, the example that, that I, I gave just now, like in, uh, in such a community where like uh, um, the solution to this quandary that I, uh, that I described earlier of, of, uh, of a community where every single square inch of land is privately owned uh, is that even though the people think them, they're free, they, they're actually in a, caught in a system of mutual domination and instrumentalization, right? And the solution to this is a set of, of public spaces called roads where people can pass and repass. And very importantly, Right. Uh, think of think of how uh, um, roads are not property. 
like uh, if you uh, um, the the structure uh, roads are not meant to be bought and sold as property rather like the state's rights with respect to uh, uh, its uh, with the provision of roads are like uh, uh, rights that pertain to its status as the public fiduciary in other words it's an aspect of its of its uh, of its uh, personality this is why you know like uh, if you and i you know say you know play football in the middle of the road the state doesn't have to prove that we caused this much of traffic jams this much of uh, uh, financial disruption all it has to do all it has to show is that uh, um, all it has to show is that our conduct is not compatible with with our playing our part in creating a rightful condition okay um, so that argument so the state it's uh, it's like a, when it's its cause of action with respect to us has the nature or aspect of inuria of of a personality wrong it's wrongful even in the absence of, of harm now i argue that uh, um, that that there is a disanalogy between the domestic rightful condition and the international rightful condition right in the domestic rightful condition um there are there are two kinds of there are two categories of things body and property and property has to be originally acquired under laws and that's the point of why we have a legislature the point of a legislature is to make it possible for us to have things external things uh, uh, subject to our own choice in other words property in the international sphere there is no legislature there is not supposed to be property at all because the only thing that concerns states is their own is their personality their office of fiduciary accountability to their people uh, the uh, um, in contrast to to the uh, the grotian uh, 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 the, the grotian scholarship that i cited earlier which 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 assumes that you know sovereignty and 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 dominion are coterminous i i like uh, i talk about a much older a uh, uh, notion where sovereignty and property are not just distinct they're actually antithetical if you if you are a sovereign you can't be a proprietor and if you're a proprietor you can't be a sovereign and uh, there's this uh, there's this uh, there's this other tradition which uh, which well is represented by Westlake and Bodine and Kant and uh, which which I draw from says that like the reason why you don't have you have this disanalogy between the domestic sphere and the international one is because there is no property in the national sphere there is no situation where like uh, somebody has to uh, act externally out of themselves in order to to turn their roads to turn some property of their own into uh, into a public road into a public road i have brought werner slener in the room because he has a question and so werner thank you thank you can you hear me Excellent. yes thank you uh, thank you very much for this, for this wonderful uh, exposition and this discussion as well. Uh, I, mean, um, I remember, of course, when you were still in Luxembourg, we had some of that. I listened to some of your earlier works as well, and I had, again, I found it very thought-provoking. Particularly now, uh, of course, um, my expertise is sort of, uh, or my interest is, is practical. I, I wonder how, how, what, uh, how much it can be transpersed but it's, to me it seems very similar so my my problems or my questions concern really um the reaction of the european union or states more general to um you might think of that also as a global good which is the question of tax coordination or mm -hmm. something to do in order to combat tax competition so there are various actions that are taken in that respect just to give you a few examples so one question that is and i understand your framework generally concerns the action of sovereigns versus individuals that are extraterritorial, not so much the action of one sovereign towards another state. Yes. So I yes. wonder to what extent that can be translated, first of all, to the extent that, for instance, the European Union puts whatever the Bahamas on the blacklist as a tax haven, and therefore then uh, that uh, is uh, commensurate to sort of imposing sanctions on the state, but also it translates into sanctions on the taxpayers who are there. So, I mean, in the end, uh, measures that are taken in that area really are intended to um, 
hit both foreign states, but also foreign individuals in particular uh, businesses who, who should be incentivized to act differently. For instance, not to set up offshore companies, but rather set their, up their companies onshore in order to, for them to pay the proper or fair amount of tax. So I'm wondering how that, what do you think about it? And, and, and the, as the discussion went on, more and more thoughts came to me. You had this um, idea, okay, it would be widely excessive exercise of jurisdiction. What was that? Um, if you were to start imposing uh, sanctions on something that one does in another jurisdiction, and mm -hmm. only once they come then into your country, then we impose the uh, sort of the sanction on them. Now, what we would say is this is what countries and also the European Union now has again proposed to do with their digital services tax, where they say this is, and this is largely discussed as a form of extraterritorial taxation, where you say, okay, there's whatever, Facebook sitting in the United States, they do whatever they do over there. Um, but then I access it sitting in Luxembourg. And because I access it, Facebook in the US now is obliged to pay tax to the European Union or to Luxembourg or to France, wherever it is, because I'm sitting here. And that is, you could, so I wonder what, what, how that relates to it. So I'm, I'm definitely, I'm going to, to have uh, to, to get your book and to read on this and then maybe pick your brain after I've done this. But I wonder whether you had any sort of uh, instantaneous um, thoughts about how that framework can be applied to thinking about the legitimacy or justification of such sort of external actions. Um, partly it's done under the, under the guise of saying, well, we want to follow, so as you would say, a public good. The public good there being, we want everyone in the world to pay their fair share of tax, whatever that is. Of course, different countries have different views on that. But the claim is that there's a public good uh, that is going to be achieved by, by, by doing that. So I wonder whether, what your thoughts on that are. Thanks. Hmm. Okay. Um, I must confess that uh, <laughs> if, if any, okay, there is no worries. <laughs> Your thoughts, if any, on that. <laughs> I must confess to not being a great, uh, uh, the world's foremost expert on uh, on uh, on on uh, on on tax uh, regulation. Uh, I'm afraid that that's you, Vanna. So, like, uh, I am. I'm going to try and and. Uh, explain this through some uh some some equally you know like uh, far-fetched but homely examples um okay so as we said earlier if a state starts making sumptuary laws dress code laws for 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 distant strangers overseas. Now, we'd say that this is just wildly improper, all right? Um, whereas if a state uh, starts imposing competition regulation or environmental regulation or data protection stuff or, or, or like that on, on foreigners, like it seems different, right? And uh, the, the reason why it's different, I argue, is because sumptuary laws are not essential for constituting the freedom of the people, all right? Uh, in fact, actually, uh, you know, dress codes, you know, they might actually count as a public good on the standard economic definition, because, you know, uh, if, if uh, something, it's, it's something that is privately undersupplied, if, if people acting on their own unilaterally might prefer not to wear a veil, so uh, uh, you know, like uh, if if uh, the majority of the, uh, the, the, the that that uh, jurisdiction find uh, that it would be that that you know this this tends to be undersupplied by people acting privately, it might be arguable that this is a public good for the state to Im impose uh, sumptuary laws. But see, that's not the argument I'm making. I'm saying that like it has to be constitutive. Uh, it has to a public good is necessary to constitute the freedom of the people. Like. And the example I gave you is roads. A community without roads will be a system of mutual domination and instrumentalization, right? Similarly, a community with, uh, you know, where rivers are privately owned, you know, uh, this, is, this is very old Scottish, very famous Scottish uh, uh, judgment which said that, you know, if rivers can be property, they can potentially be sold to one man. And if uh, that would, 
it would it would it would be within its power to lay waste the whole country if that's the case right for the same reason because some things should be held publicly not privately similarly i would argue that perhaps a lot of uh, uh, social media platforms uh, you know uh, the the way uh, um, the way our data is sort of uh, collected it uh, it it tends to sort it be used by by private uh, by massive private corporations to sort of cocoon us into our own echo bubbles and and uh, sorry echo chambers and uh, and we end up you know being prisoners in our own homes just like the people in the roadless community that i uh, that that i described earlier so so the, the the point i'm trying to make is that if you want to argue that that something is a public good you have to come up with some kind of argument for why it is necessary to constitute the freedom of the people right and so if i've demonstrated how this might work for you know data protection regulation stuff like that the next question is what justifies a state in enforcing in bringing distant strangers into its scheme of public regulation of of the provision of public goods um just like just like dom okay just like domestic polluters foreign polluters might just as equally threaten the public good just you know like foreign uh, 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 social media platforms might just as equally imprison your people into echo chambers all right now the question is does the state have to wait for some sort of international consensus or international uh, uh, um, some kind of international mechanism before it can uh, uh, be before it can regulate these people uh, i would say no because to impose such a requirement upon each political community upon a, 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 a political community would render it subject to the arbitrary will of everybody else in the in the in in the performance of its sole purpose which is providing a system of equal freedom for its people now you might counter and say well doesn't the state uh, um that doesn't the state uh, doesn't the state imposing unilaterally extending its uh, public regulation to uh, to 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 distant strangers doesn't that render the distant stranger subject to the will uh, to the arbitrary will of the regulating state i would say first of all no because nothing anybody does which is necessary sorry uh, helen you want to say something yeah i i would say that uh, matthias will have to 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 leave us uh, very soon so uh oh. i don't want to deprive you from the the answer and this uh, very interesting discussion but uh, just to thank matthias for his comments and uh and uh, if he has to live before uh, I have the opportunity to close this uh, this this webinar. So just uh, sorry, but now I know very, he has very to sorry about so. that. Very <laughs> sorry about that. Yeah. Bye bye. Thank you very much. Thank you so much for. It was a pleasure to have you as ever. Thank you. So sorry for having interrupted. If you could uh, wrap up now, because uh, okay, yeah. yeah. Mm. Just first of all, nothing anyone does to ensure their independence is can be a wrong as to anybody else. Okay, um, and secondly, because when the state uh, uh, when the state uh, uh, you know imposes its public regulation of its regulation upon a distant stranger that threatens its pub, its uh, uh, its rightful condition, you know, it is expected that that uh, that uh, the the distant stranger becomes a kind of constructive member of that political community so so it is entitled to, to the obligations of accountability from that state itself so in this sense they so this is how it, it this, so this is how it's different this is how it, it actually it's fine for uh, uh for for any political community to assert jurisdiction over distant strangers as long as you have to show that this is necessary you have to show that you know what the distant strangers are doing represents a threat to the public good uh, and global I, I think i think i think it works for regulation i'm not so sure it works for tax but i thank you very much for that uh, for that answer anyway cheers yeah and i i think it shows very well that you're uh 
how your book can be uh, and your approach can be related to very contemporaneous uh, uh, issues and uh, even uh, hot ones and uh, it's it's difficult to have straightforward answers but a, a, at least what is fascinating is how you can put a would say a, a, a frame of a political theory and uh, and also philosophy around all this uh, these issues and i think it, it's it's really uh, fascinating to be able to 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 relate uh, all this uh, the way you you've done so um Thank you very much for, for that. Uh, we had uh, some idea before you started talking, but uh, what was also fascinating, I think, is, is the, the, uh, the way in which you have refined your, your, your thought uh, along the years and uh, how now you're able to a certain extent, because uh, the debate could go on, I could have a, uh, asked questions as well, but uh, at least you're able to, to uh, to to bring the circle of of your thesis to 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 a close in the sense that you've been up to the end of your uh, uh, reflection on that and that's very uh, remarkable and uh, uh, I think we we are all here to congratulate you for this uh, great achievement and uh, and the wonderful book which is out of uh, of that so. Thank you very much, Ravind. I don't know whether you would like to add something on your side to. I'd like to add that this is a, this is a great honor. Thank you so much for having me. And uh, the four years uh, I spent uh, working um, you know, in your department were, were just amazing. It was it was the I I could not have done this without you. I really <laughs> could not. I owe so much to you. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, Alvin. And thank you for having been the, the, the guest of our first uh, uh, alumni uh, uh, lecture series. Uh, I think we, we, we started uh, very high. So now we have to go on uh, and to keep the pace uh, with uh, other of your uh, former fellows. And uh, all the best uh, to you. And uh, I thank uh, all the attendees and uh, say you bye-bye. Uh, Bye-bye. Thank you.